Pinot Noir is not my favorite grape variety <laughs> at all. We're talking about trying to find the truth of our place. Mm, super delicious. But the only skill I'd actually acquired was the capacity to drink a lot. And oh, I thought it'd be a shame to waste such a use useful skill, so I became a wine maker. <laughs> That's on the t-shirt. I can see the t-shirt right now. Hello, everybody out there. Here is Hamburg, Germany, Wine Unlimited calling. My name is Hendrik, but more importantly, we have a guest today from very far away. Some people say it's the country of Oz. Some people say down under. And specifically, it's the Bobo Shire. Which sounds a bit, a bit like uh, Lord of the Rings, the Bobo Shire, the Shire, the Shire. Yes. This is William, aka Bill Downey from Gippsland, which is in which state of Australia? Victoria. So yes. the southeastern most part of Australia. You're making wine there? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Yes. Have been known to on occasion. Mm -hmm. which, which, uh, which is your favorite grape? Uh, that was not a good question to ask. Okay. Because, because Pinot Noir is not my favorite grape variety <laughs> at all. And in fact, the, the true answer to the question is, I don't really care what the grape variety of any wine is. Okay. That I, I'm interested in wines that taste like they came from somewhere that were made by somebody who so, cares about what they're doing. So the, the, the variety is the, basically the tool. Yeah, well, and we haven't put a grape variety on a bottle of wine for over 20 years. Okay, yeah, it's interesting that you say this. For, me, lots of people for me, this is logic. <laughs> Most people assume that it says Pinot Noir on the label, but actually it hasn't done for over 20 years. So this was a cold start here. William uh, is known in Australia, I think you're basically known for being uh, unconventional in, in many ways, and you have a mind set. Slightly annoying, I think would be the general. <laughs> well, I was trying to be polite, you know, <laughs> and um, also being very frank about what he's doing. Yes, and you're very much in probably... agriculture. Yeah. yeah. More in, th that's what's interesting, what I learned today from you, that you're more in agriculture than really into making wine, or making yes. wine is just a result of being interested in agriculture. Yes, and, and I, only, I only started making wine by accident. My my ambition, my career ambition in wine was was to be a viticulturalist, a grape grower, not not a winemaker. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was well into my wine career before I before I ticked over the point where I had spent more time working in the winery than I had in the vineyard. That was six, seven years into my career before I was accidentally a winemaker. Okay, but it was never my intention. What, what is the fascination about wine then? After agriculture, of course, then you moved into wine. And well, what I used to say, because I was a, a, a bass player in a, in a rock and roll band, as we were talking about just before, and I, I, used, to, I used to say to people that I ended up uh, in wine because after seven years of being a bass player in a rock and roll band, I realized that I was still a terrible bass player <laughs> and that the only skill I'd actually acquired was the capacity to drink a lot. And oh, okay. I thought it'd be a shame to waste such a use, useful skill, so I became a winemaker. So now you are in an area, I mean, in, in Europe, we basically have our stereotype of Australia. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're far away, and of course, we think of insects, and we think of poison, and we think of other things. Uh, in terms of wine, there is a stereotype for the wines from Australia, I would say, in a, as a general rule. Yes. Um, big and heavy, bold, mm -hmm. oaky. Um, Juicy, uh, easy going, and uh, I think when I well I tasted your wines this morning, I have a feeling that's a bit of the opposite here. Well, you know, it's a big country. There's there's huh. a lot that's possible in Australia. It's you know when you think if you go from one side of the country to the the other, if you, or if you they actually used to have maps that you could buy that had European countries kind of plonked onto the map. Yeah. And there's a lot of European countries that fit inside fit. <laughs> the, the same area as yeah. Australia. So yeah. there's actually a lot that's possible yeah. in Australia. It's just a lot, a lot of it hasn't been explored. And, and what has been explored often was, was explored by people who weren't necessarily looking to find the kinds of things that would interest us. Mm -hmm. So that the idea of making wine which isn't big, ripe, bold, oaky, 
um, that that's a, a fairly that's modern that's new to us there's a it's mm. it's kind of mostly yeah. mostly my generation and younger that that yeah. have gone looking for that yeah. in in our country it's diversity really I mean that's what what it is and I think yeah. many people underestimate your country or your continent uh, uh, in general, I mean, not the people who've been there necessarily, but just from what they've seen or what they've heard. So yep. it's a lot of fairy tales. No, no, I used to say, I said that for many, many years when I first started that I didn't, I didn't want everyone in the Barossa Valley to stop doing what they were doing. I, I, hmm. I think that those big, fat, ripe, juicy wines appeal to a certain demographic. I just have always, had always felt that we needed more diversity, not stop doing that and do this, hmm. but, but, People add -ons. should explore a whole mm. range of yeah. ways of working. And Australians historically haven't been very good at that. We tend to we tend to watch what's happening, and if something works, then everyone does that. And and that definitely happened in in the early two thousands when the mm. the whole Robert Parker thing happened, and mm -hmm. the bro those big ripe Barossa Valley wines were very successful in the US. That meant everyone tried to do that. And then when that stopped working and pale rosé became a thing, everyone did that. And then, mm. and so people have often just tried to find the trend and, and follow that where now, just really recently, we're starting to see mm -hmm. a proper diversification of mm -hmm. style and approach and thinking and, and as a result, some more diversity of mm -hmm. wine. I think that goes hand in hand with also culinary wise mm -hmm. in, in what I've experienced and what I've seen on my very few visits, but mm -hmm. I could see um, a totally different picture when then I was expecting. Yep. Diversity, especially mm -hmm. Melbourne, uh, I guess Sydney is the same. I, that's, a, that's a place I haven't been, but Melbourne is known for being like culinary, let's say secret uh, capital of the, the, con the country. Yeah, definitely. and. I th it's probably true in all parts of the world, but but wine always follows food in mm. in terms of trend and education. And yeah. I guess there are a lot more people who are engaged and interested in the culture of food than than wine in most cases. So often, and often chefs are are more progressive, and um, they they ironically engage more often with. The farmers that they're sourcing produce from than than a lot of winemakers in our country mm -hmm. who work for large corporations. They don't really engage with grape growers and and they don't engage necessarily in yeah. in agriculture. Where yeah. a lot of chefs, certainly the chefs that we know well, they they're deeply interested yeah. in in their connection to the to the person who grows the produce that they use in their restaurant. So they tend to be quite progressive, quite open minded. Mm. Um, and, and wine, the trends in wine absolutely follow the trends in food. No yeah, doubt. when you see for a meal that wine can be like a spice or another ingredient to enhance, I mean, not talking about the alcohol, I'm talking about what you taste, about mm. the memories you get from it. Uh, I think this is where, yeah, where you can perfectly pop in. I mean, it's also a bit about telling new stories. Uh, mm. Your area is pretty remote and not far from Melbourne, I learned. It's um, it, it's very it's a very big area. Yes, with very little vineyards. Yeah, it's it's actually really in our little part, the Borbore Shire, which is in the the western edge of Gippsland. Um, there's lots of really unhelpful names and terminology when it comes to Gippsland because we're to the right. east of Melbourne, yeah. but all the things that are nearby to us are called west. So there's right. Western Port Bay, which is to the east of Port Phillip Bay, even though it's called Western Port Bay. Okay. And we're in what is often called West Gippsland, which is just to the east of to Melbourne. East. Does it have to do that you're yeah. on the <laughs> Southern Hemisphere? <laughs> yeah, people get really quite confused, which is one of the reasons why we, we often talk about the Borbore Shire, which is where all of our vineyards are. Because at least then, if you Google Borbore Shire, there's a map with a line on it that shows you exactly, exactly where it is. But in fact, we're quite close to Melbourne. We're only about an hour, a bit over an hour's drive mm -hmm. south and east of Melbourne. Um, but not a lot of vineyards in our area, not, not a long history of grape growing, but, but a really unusual, interesting, I, we think exciting mm -hmm. viticultural region in Australia, partly because it, it rains. Most people's kind of 
again, the stereotypical idea of Australia is hot, yeah. dry, yeah. Um, dusty, dusty yeah. uh, Red landscape. Sweats. Yeah, oh. where where we are is is lush, green. It rains all year round. We have really high rainfall compared to a lot of viticultural regions, even in Europe. So, in our part of the world, there are no irrigated vineyards. Um, we we have we kind of it's it's not always easy for us to get the grapes ripe. Even Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are marginal in some of the sites that we have. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of it's quite unusual by mm -hmm. by Australian standards and and in the context of what most people's perception of Australian wine. I, I, is. I learned your yields are low as here in Europe, Priorat, for example, between six six to ten hectoliters per hectare. Yeah, that's about what we that's what we've it's averaged incredible. for. For, yeah, and that often it's probably in somewhere like Priorat, I don't know, partly I would assume that's really old vines and, and hot. dry climate, and hot. Mm. where we're kind of, not the opposite, but we, we do have some older vines, but, mm. but our problem is um, poor flowering. We just, the weather is often so wet and windy during mm. the fruit set and flowering that we end up with 20, 30 gram bunches if we're lucky, so it's, that's the thing which reduces our yield so much. So I Plus think me not being all that good at viticulture, and that doesn't help. Pardon me? <laughs> I'm not very good at growing grapes either. That probably has something to do with it. Okay, well, everybody has I'm to trying. do something. I'm learning, yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know, I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah, you're very humble. I, I noticed that. And this, this is, I think, makes you even more interesting as a person. But um, let's, let's get into this, because let's get into the wines, because the air is really getting dry in here. Uh, so I feel almost like desertic. <laughs> Interesting label. Yes. Well, that we allowed to look Are we? over our shoulder in in your in your favour, which I still can't believe in they're the there in the favour of uh, Reg, your friend. Yes, Mombasa. Well, I don't know. I I would be a bit shy to to call him a friend. Okay. He's he's one of my all time heroes, and he makes me incredibly nervous. So I don't think he really has a clue who I am or. Oh. I don't know if he even likes me because mostly I'm kind of fumbling and nervous and saying stupid, incoherent things. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we we saw them and we we fell in love. I mean, also on the first side I, when I saw these, they said they're so unique these these labels, and I understood like there was a bit of a coincidence or not not say coincidence, but it was unexpected out of the blue that you were able to use these. Yeah, it was it was one of those things where I, I didn't expect, you know, you have a dream and you imagine, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? But you just assume that it couldn't happen, so you don't fully <laughs> form the idea. It's, even, just, yes. it's just a wild, stupid idea. And then when out of the blue, accidentally, it actually happens, all of a sudden it's like, oh, now what do I do? I didn't know this was going to happen. Um, but equally, since so the, the association with Reg, who's extremely famous in Australia, um, and it is kind of ironic in a way to have to fly halfway around the world to see that work over there <laughs> full size because it's on the, on the bottle of one of our wines, but I've never seen it in its kind of proper form. I love them. I have to say they're beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Reg. If you ever see this, let me say this. <laughs> Thank you that you're also shipping to Germany. Yes. <laughs> but we, yeah, it was just, I guess what, what is kind of interesting about how the labels happened is you, you, it's easy to kind of look at it and be like, of course that worked because he's a genius. His work is amazing. His, his work is incredible is unique it has a style which is so easily identified mm -hmm. and and while it and it was interesting earlier we were looking at a label which was very similar mm -hmm. but nowhere near the same no and and there's just something about Reg's work which is simple but but of the highest level that means you can just stick it on there and it works you don't it doesn't need me to do anything because the standard of Reg's work is so high that that even an idiot like me can make it look good on a bottle of wine. When I saw it, it's interesting, you know, that's, I think, where art can have such an impact. When I saw them first, also when I see your labels, 
takes me right. I don't need to look at anything written in the front. It takes me right to Australia. I guess mm. it's the colors, but I guess it has to do with once you've been there or it, there is something about it, like it takes you right away. It, it, sometimes like when you see movies and you think like, oh, where, which city is that? And, mm. and then, ah, that must be Paris. Yeah. And so they like this. This is my feeling about yeah, it. Yeah, and I didn't... So I, get, I, I really do view them as as not they're not necessarily they're not works of art on the front of a bottle they're they're a window you're looking into the wine when you look at that they're like a look a window inside into Mm -hmm. the inside of the bottle which was not intentional i didn't know that that was how i was going to feel about it what's happening it was purely accidental but again the reg's work is so compelling and of such a high standard that that of course we would end up feeling that way about it because that's just the, the level that he works at. Mm. It's, it always has it and, and still does feel like an extraordinary privilege to have his work on the bottles. And people love it. They really do. We do as well. So now we talk about your work, what's inside the bottle. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of your vignettes. I mean, you have an, I wouldn't say, an, this is a, I think is a strange word, entry level wine. I wouldn't yes. say, but maybe it's your signature wine or your liquid business card or winemaking card or a vignon card, which is called Cathedral Cellar. Yep. This is the one you produce the most. Yes. We don't have that. Then you have a Bobo Shire, a Gipps, Gippsland, Gippsland. Um, but, which is a regional wine. Yes. Yeah, so the idea is the, the cathedral is multi regional blend. Not no fruit from Gippsland because again Gippsland is mm, has so small. little vineyard area yeah. that that it's quite precious. So when it, whatever fruit we mm-hmm. have from Gippsland is going to be bottled as Gippsland or a single vineyard. Um, so Gippsland uh, Cathedral is kind of giving you a, an introduction to introduction. That's a good word. Yeah. Okay, glad I, I, I was I was looking um, for it. <laughs> no, but it, it kind of gives you a sense of being yeah. in Australia. Yeah. Through Pinot Noir, but that's not the most important part of it, of course. But you kind of have an introduction there to what mm. what wine in our part of the world can look like. Yeah. And, and it's a it's a well, it's something. If you give that business card, I would say, is not what you expect because that's a very elegant wine. The cathedral, yes. And the very viviability on French. I like the word drinkable, um, fine and yeah, high toned wine. Yeah, and and that was. A, a process of trying to figure out well what is the real story of mm. that we're trying to tell about wine from our part of the world in the context of what you were saying earlier where when people's perception or preconceived idea of what Australian wine looks like is big fat bold ripe oaky when when that's really not the whole story no. to have something which which has all of those things that you talk about but is is multi-regional blend mm. is just another way of introducing or reintroducing people to wine from Australia, really, I suppose. Mm. It's different when we sell that wine in Australia, people kind of aren't trying to figure out what the hell Australian wine's about. But but certainly if we ship it halfway around the world, it's not a bad way to reintroduce people to Australian wine. I it's suppose. fantastic because you know it strikes you and it makes you if you are if you have that sensibility it makes you feel that the world is certainly not black and white. Mm. It's gray and it's diverse and you can basically accept it the way it is. And I think, um, well, I always call it wine prejudice mm-hmm. and that's or wine racism, even if it's a yeah. bit, even you know, stronger word. But it's, it's a bit like, I think what is so great about wine, it can teach you the other side. Yeah. And this is what I learned about your wines. Well, Camp, thank you. Camp Hill. So, <laughs> so we well we we have cathedral and then we have a wine from Gippsland which is not it can be a single vineyard wine in some years it's not always often it it gets bits of leftover barrels from the single vineyard wines but it's kind of zooming in a little bit and starting to talk more specifically about a sense of place in mm-hmm. a, in a more precise kind of way and then from there we have the single vineyard wines, which really are zooming in on not just our little part of Gippsland, but some some very specific parts of our little region that we're in. Um, I loved something you said this morning. 
that oh, I'm glad. No, no to many hear things, that, but, but it wasn't <laughs> an hour and a half of utterly uninteresting. Rubbish. No, no, it's very, it's very, it's it's uh, you know we need some time. There was I guess. something. Yes. No, there, there was something. <laughs> something I really enjoyed is that you said like you want to make the wine like without your visibility, mm. and that the wine, uh, which is very humble, and I think uh, also it sounds like a lot of work. Well, I, you know, I, I'm not very interesting, but. But our little part of West Gippsland, Bauble Shire, is actually really interesting. It's unique in Australia as a landscape. It has a soil type which doesn't exist elsewhere in Australia. There are similar soil types, but not that soil type anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So to me, you don't, what have I, why would you want to know about me when you could know about that? So I'm mm -hmm. just trying to get out of the way so <laughs> that you can, you can see the truth of our little, you can kind of, in your glass come and visit our little part of the world to me that's just so much more interesting than than coming to visit me especially in a world full of kardashians and lots of egos that's that's good to hear that's, yeah well, that that still exists. i don't <laughs> that, ironically there are actually plenty of winemakers in australia who do think they have a massive ego um and I'm not, I can never tell if they're right or not. But anyway, thank well, you for, for not. It thinking. accounts. It accounts for sommeliers. It accounts. I think it in any business you mm. are there. It's it's. Let's go and taste this wine. Yes. But because that now we we learned, it's very little yields. It's vineyards planted in the eighties nineties. Uh, Camp Hills planted around about. Uh, 2000. I can never actually quite remember yeah, whether it was something. 99 okay. or 2000 or mm. 2001, but <laughs> about you know heading towards 25 year old vines. Mm -hmm. um, and this vineyard's right on top of a, a really exposed hill in the middle of the Borbore Shire, and and in fact you can stand at the top of the vineyard and turn around and you can see the whole region. Every little part of it is visible from the top of the hill, mm -hmm. um, and. As I was saying earlier, to me, there's something about how exposed this vineyard is um, and what that, what that does to the vines, both in terms of sunlight, air mm. movement, yeah. humidity. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite different to some of the other parts of the Borbo Shire, which, mm. which are more sheltered. Um, get less sunlight, but they're at lower elevation. There's something about how exposed this site is and in some ways you would say you would think given this gets the most amount of sunlight that it might be the most intense and concentrated wine but in fact it's it's the most delicate fine elegant um lifted of of the single vineyard wines um i like the brightness in it there is something like it's really like this red fruit i, I understand you're not the biggest fan of wine descriptions, especially when mm. it comes to fruits and spices. You said you leave that to the sommeliers or communicators. Yeah. But, but this lifted, but I mean, for, for at, at some point, we, when you talk about wine, of course, you have to use certain vocabularies and they basically just stand for something. But mm. I find this very bright and it's not based on tenants, this wine. Well, there's tenants, but it's, the, the tenants are super fine, silky. It's based basically built up on acidity which is like a linear thing. So, wow, you get a big, fr you know, freshness, fruit, you get like ethereal smells, especially in the nose. And a somewhat, what I'd say, rustic, not rustic, I would say, but it's an earthy damp, it's an earthy yeah. damp fl flavor. This is all I get. I hope that's okay if I, if I describe the wine to Sounds that extent. Good to me. Yeah, you can uh, write the taste. Uh, 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 there, is no, uh, <laughs> there is no blueberries and then, you know, all this. No, there never is in this wine. It's, it's always about those high toned floral mm -hmm. lifted um, flavors it's, it's never about deep yep. dark rich fruit that's that's just not the, the place and if we're standing there on top of the hill talking about this it would be pretty easy to kind of give you a sense of why that is the case um, super delicious thank you uh, sorry yeah, camp hill hmm? camp hill wow um, when you when you mentioned um, this morning, well, first of all about about the site, and uh, this is something like where you said like it's a bit like you know getting a rope in your hand, like you're looking for something which is maybe the the sense of your life, your mm -hmm. working life, what you want to play. And after a couple of years, you said you found wow, it's working. It's like you are able to display 
this kind of terroirs or the notion of terroir, where maybe not for Australia, but only for France. But there is something where you can really distinguish these wines and they show the place where they're from, sense of place. Yes, yeah, and that is when I first became interested in wine, it was because of that. And I don't I have any, I've never been able to quite figure out why why I even knew that that was a thing or or how I kind of found that idea, but it, it, it popped up very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that that's absolutely what drew me into wine is the idea that you could be transported to another place at another point in time. That, that was just straight away why, why I wanted to know more about wine. Um, and it's not, that's not an idea that's kind of well formed or, or understood in a, in a deep cultural sense in Australia. We kind of, we view wine as a grape variety and, and a person's name, you know. There's, mm -hmm. if you, if, if, for a lot of Australians, if you, if you ask them what's, What's, what sort of wine do you like to drink? They'll say, I like Shiraz or I like Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's something about that way of thinking which, which is really the driver of a lot of thinking in Australian wine. Mm -hmm. um, but, but for me, the idea of sense of place is the only reason mm -hmm. that you would continue to do this difficult thing that we mm -hmm. do. Um, and, and I have always believed that, that a, lot was, a lot more was possible in Australia than we had had the chance to see. Mm -hmm. And part of that, you know, were, I had had little insights to it. I worked, you know, my first job was working for Philip Jones at Bass Phillip, mm -hmm. which is a, a very, very famous Pinot yeah. Noir producer. And mm -hmm. he, he absolutely subscribed to that. And there's no doubt that his influence mm -hmm. did point me in a direction. But not, not a lot of other people were that committed to the idea of, wine as an expression of place. There's a lot of people who talk about it who aren't necessarily that committed to it. But but to to be to have spent twenty years exploring that idea and trying to figure out what was possible to get to this point where we had these vineyards that we leased. These ones are the least ones we do own a vineyard as well. Um, and to to have the opportunity to see these single vineyards that are within a, a fairly small area to be able to taste them side by side and see really profound and significant differences between the wines and consistently vintage to vintage mm -hmm. the same things. Um, yeah, that's really reassuring. Um, that really does give us motivation to continue and learn and try and do mm -hmm. things better and understand how to grow grapes in, in the place where we are. And also uh, we're kind of, we're in Australia. We're not. We're not. We're kind of referential in a in a lot of ways. We we assume that that if it's from Burgundy, it's definitely better than anything that we mm. could do. Okay. And we kind we culturally just live live that kind of idea, mm -hmm. and that's never sat sat that that comfortably with me partly because i think i spent a bit of time in burgundy i was asking yeah so but you learned i guess um lots of the techniques and the, for the land the love for the land and uh, the engagement and yeah. i mean that's that's a very particular spot in the in the whole wine world i think burgundy. but it also what it, it taught me that there's no reason that that's not possible. That we can't yes we can't work at the same level mm -hmm. as as somewhere like that there's there's nothing so superior about mm -hmm. somewhere like Burgundy that, that you can't make wines that are as expressive as that on a kind of detailed, small scale way. Yeah. There's no reason why you can't do that somewhere else in the world. You just have to want to do it and you have to put in the work and, oh. and learn by ex solve problems from first principles, learn by observation. Mm -hmm. You can go and just pick up all those ideas from somewhere like Burgundy plonk them down in Australia and make something like a copycat. A copycat, but that's mm. not really what we're talking about mm. here. We're, we're talking about trying to find the truth of our place. Mm. And, and I, I do feel as though if we are deeply committed to that ideal and if we can develop a proper cultural connection to place in a meaningful way, which Australians aren't mm. so good at, um, then there's no reason we can't assume our rightful place 
as the equal to all other, you know, in a, in a different way. And, and this is not talking about whether we can make wine consistently that gets 100 points from a journalist or mm. that people think is better than Romani Conti. But the idea that we can make wine which has as much to say mm -hmm. as, as a wine, any wine from Burgundy, that can transport you in a kind of emotional way to another place in the way that somewhere like Burgundy can mm -hmm. do. I, I absolutely believe that that's possible. And I've, it's been reassuring in the last couple of years to finally mm -hmm. have a little glimpse of, of that possibility through these, these wines. And these are not, there's a long way for us to go. We've still got a lot of work to do, but that has been I think deeply are, reassuring to, to get a bit of a picture into what's possible. I think you're not the only one who thinks like this. I have friends in South Africa, in Argentina, oh, yeah. in Italy. Oh, and I'm, I'm certainly it, not, not I'm, assuming what I'm, I'm the other. No, no, but I didn't want to say it, but what I'm saying is like, I think we are now, um, let's say historically, exactly at this point mm. where we can find out or where, where, where people like you, like-minded people like you, just prove the point that it, it's possible. Well, and, and happily we've arrived at a point where, where people are open to that idea no. who aren't, well, you know, with mm -hmm. the extraordinary help of people like you who go out and do the education and encourage people to try things that they might mm -hmm. not otherwise no. have tried. No. We, we do meet a lot of people now who, from all around the world, who've had these interesting experiences mm -hmm. in South Africa or Argentina, you know, through wine, Mm -hmm. who, who are now much more open to, mm -hmm. to seeing wines from other parts of the world as the equal to the famous places. Borders were made by men, not by nature. And so I guess it's a bit like Thoreau. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bull Swamp, it's not far away from the Camp Hill. It's about, That's it's the other four side you have, yeah. four kilometers. Yeah, to the south and east of Camp Hill. It's different, different wine. I, I have, we have them now side by side. I drank my glass of Camp Hill, if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've just realized actually when we're, <laughs> we're doing this, that yeah. I've spent, so I, I hate wine cliches and one of the worst wine cliches that I really hate for no good reason. Uh. I probably should get a hobby or something, but I hate that kind of classic wine photograph of the winemaker with their nose with in the, the glass. Nose. Yes. So I can't bring myself to pick up the glass and taste okay. it for fear of being like on camera okay. tasting <laughs> the wine. <laughs> so we, well, anyway, I, I, I understand you know how the wine tastes anyway. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah I'm sick of the side of it. But what I, what I noticed in this wine is in the Bull Swamp is they, it seems like it got a bit more amplifying uh, not more uh, amplifying is the word or more more sound more bass yeah it's more, more bass maybe. it's definitely denser if it's music if it's music we want to go yeah with. yep and so the these vineyards four kilometers apart but there's a hundred meters of elevation difference bull swamp at 150 and camp hill at 250 and as i was saying That's with hard. camp hill we have mm. a vineyard right on top of the hill that's quite exposed and at bull swamp it sits down more into the landscape in a, in a kind of gentle, not a valley, but a gentle kind of depression in the landscape. It still gets plenty of sunlight, but, but it's much more sheltered. Um, and also, so there's, a, there's about two weeks difference <coughs> in harvest date between Bull Swamp and Camp Hill. When you add, because where we are is, is really marginal, uh, the more elevation, the later the harvest. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you get past the middle of March for us, then it cools, things cool down a lot. Mm -hmm. So as you go up in elevation and the harvest gets a little bit later, things slow down dramatically. Um, so yeah, anyway, Bull Swamp harvested usually about two weeks ahead of Camp Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always denser and richer and, and much more about its connection to the soil. It's got always dark fruit, earth. Mm -hmm always that rusted iron character that's so much a part of the soil type and, and the character of the place. I get a bit more um, black pepper or pepper, or if, mm. it's, if we say this is more a, a bright cherry, then this would be more um, oh, yeah, the Bing cherry or more sweeter, then not sweeter, but the more riper style. Yeah. Yeah. Still, there's, there's also this, um, again, acidity seems to be a key in understanding a bit of uh, your wines. And you have to love acidity in order to love those wines, I think. So, but Pinot Noir is a bit like Riesling and like other varieties which yes. are based on acidity. But then that acidity is like almost like 
gives you such a lift and makes it so refreshing and basically takes the wine over the throat into mm. your yeah what, what's this part buzz i think it's called your neck in my it? neck in my neck <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I could be wrong, but that's what we call it anyway. Okay. No, but this part, this part. <laughs> Sorry. The, oh, so it's you have the tongue, the throat. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for saying this. <laughs> Rachel, oh. thank you so much. I'm not always this unhelpful. Thanks I for can't. helping me. Next time we do it. We do the interview. <coughs> okay. Wow. Um, <coughs> yes. <laughs> not my... Nice choking on it. <laughs> so that basically is the proof. Well, you know, it's a, it's an insight. It's some kind of compelling evidence, if not mm. not proof. But it certainly gives us reason to continue to, continue. to try mm. and to learn and improve. Um, we still still have a long way to go. There's still a lot that we don't know about mm-hmm. how the how the vines interact with that landscape. There's, there's a lot to do. Um, go, we haven't talked about the techniques. I mean, we don't have to be too technical, I guess, but um, still very interesting. Like, are you, which oak kind, do you use oak? Which oak are you using? Do you, which, which ones do you prefer? Um, another thing is whole cluster or not and things like this. I think this can be very interesting uh, because I guess that's what you've learned in Burgundy. Yeah, well, some part of it. Are. The thing, the thing that I, I think people forget in about Burgundy is that people. It's common in Australia anyway. People say, "Oh, the wine, blah blah blah," using Burgundian techniques. But if you've spent any time in Burgundy, if you're making wine, you're using a Burgundian technique because it, there's every conceivable possible approach and variation mm-hmm. exists in Burgundy. There's so many wine producers with so many ideas that. That everything that's winemaking exists. So in basically, it's all there. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, for me, I I didn't. There's not any whole bunch in these wines because uh, the vine, the the established vineyards that we have, the mm. least hold ones, are planted at fairly wide row spacing. You know, we're talking two about two thousand vines per hectare. Okay. And what we what we found was at that density where you have twenty bunches of vine or mm. something, if you if you ferment with whole bunches, you can really taste the the stems mm-hmm. in a way that I think doesn't doesn't help express the place. It becomes mm. more about the stalks. Mm-hmm. Um, the vineyard yeah, at home, which is ten thousand vines per hectare, part of the reason it is at ten thousand mm-hmm. vines per hectare is so that we can ferment with whole bunches without mm-hmm. it tasting like stems mm-hmm. um, but yeah everything's for these wines hand harvested into small crates tipped onto a sorting conveyor hand sorted mostly by my mum and dad with a bit of help from me de-stemmed and then by gravity we'll tip those berries into open fermenters and that's it there's no we don't have any we don't own any means of temperature control there's no additions no punch downs no pump overs, all that, you know, on the rarest occasion, there might be the odd pump over at the end of fermentation if things aren't going well or whatever. But, but in general, across the board, it's just grapes in a tank for a month with no, no manipulation. Mm-hmm. Pressed, always everything that comes out of the press goes back in to the wine and then it goes into... These wines have no new oak, but we do, we do use some oak... Uh, well, it's in oak barrels all of which are made in Australia and not, it's French oak, but made in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, we do use some acacia as well, mm-hmm. uh, but no new oak in the single vineyard wines. The new oak only goes into the next level down um, because these are in such small quantities, we don't, it, any percentage of new oak is gonna be too much for too these much wines. For this, no. And you know, in in if you think about all the things I was just talking about, in a way to have, to use French oak is, stupidity and, and counterproductive um, and we, we have been working for for a number of years on a project to fix that where we we did um, a, a few years ago and make some barrels from blackwood which is the trees one of the dominant tree species that in grows the in the stress lakey range mm-hmm. and in the fullness of time hopefully we'll get to the point where the wines are aged in barrels made from mm-hmm. trees grown in the landscape where we are Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, we, we 
we try to we use French oak, but we try to make sure that there's not mm -hmm. any discernible oak character in the wine because that would be counterproductive. And then I guess it's not filtered, it's not fined. No. Do, you, do you sulfur a bit or? Yeah, yes. yeah, and that's varied a bit over time. But, you know, we started off with fairly, 20 years ago with fairly conventional sulfur dioxide levels. They went down to the point where around 2015, well, in 2015, none of the wines had any sulfur addition. Addition at well. Um, and then we just found that that wasn't quite the outcome that we were looking for mm. and nor was it the outcome that the people who had been buying the wines for a while mm. were looking for. So so we've kind of slowly gone back up again to sort of somewhere in the middle, you know, 40 mm. milligrams. Yeah, but this is so low in com comparison what's what's possible or what's the, the, the standard. Yeah, and, and it was, for, uh, for me, it was trying to understand what the limits mm. are and then we found the limits and so then we've stepped back a little bit mm -hmm. um, Rather than just saying, well, the book says the limit's here, so we just won't go past, we, we just kept mm -hmm. exploring what was, what, trying to find where the limits were, yeah. and then we did find them. And yeah, I think back. that's a very refreshing comment you just made, and I think this is very much, I think, when I look at the European wine scene, what we see here, I think at the point, a couple of years ago, five years ago, everybody was trying to push so hard. Mm. I think many people pushed too hard and over the limit. Mm -hmm. And now I think some people go with that learning curve back to, um, let's say, a little less tough approach. And yep. uh, also, I think also that's very egocentric sometimes if you're pushing Absolutely. your per personal limits too far because it's still people who are buying this and drinking it. And so we don't want to disappoint them. Yeah, and for me, it was never about an, an ideological position. Mm. It was, it was, a position of meeting meeting someone who made wines without sulfur dioxide that were the most pure, pristine, beautiful expressions of place that I'd ever seen, um, and thinking, "Wow, that's that's something I need to understand and potentially hope." Well, you know, maybe maybe that's how we can find our mm. truest expression of place. But you know, we never never have considered ourselves to be in the natural wine business. We've always been in the fine wine business. Mm -hmm. And, and this exploration or with around understanding the role of sulfur dioxide in wine mm. was about trying to make finer wine, not more mm. natural wine, mm. and not, not really, not concerned about a philosophical position, just trying to figure out how to make the truest expression yeah. of place. Das war ein schöner Schlusssatz. That was in German. That, I think that sentence really oh, I didn't figure that, made a, made a you did yeah. <laughs> Yeah, your German is coming along <laughs> after, coming after, after... I can tell that was after in German. 16 hours. definitely improved. <laughs> Thank you so much, William. That was a pleasure. I mean, um, that, that was probably... We, we did a bit, you know, longer than expected, but um, I think your story is so, so interesting and so specific that it needs that explanation because still many people are not aware of it. And I'm, I'm very happy that you are making, with Rachel and your family, this contribution to the wine world and show us that there is... Things possible, which a lot of people we, probably we would really have never... appreciate your contribution, helping you. educate people. And if if you if you left it to me to kind of do a video to explain to people what was going on, it would never happen. So thank you. <laughs> we did it. We Thanks did. for coming all the way. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Bill. And um, right, you're coming. Clock, you, you're coming. You're coming. Uh, um, maybe to Europe next year with your band. Possibly. Can you tell us the name of the band? The Yeasty Boys. Okay, we're going to watch you then. Are you going to be on television with the Yeasty Boys? I don't think so. No. So we have to come to concert. Yeah. Okay. We're going to let you know. Okay. I, I don't think TV and the Yeasty Boys is not a thing. That's not a good idea. Okay. No sleep till <laughs> Hamburg. <laughs> That could be like... Uh, ah, absolutely. Clear. That's on the T-shirt. I can see the T-shirt right now. Done. See ya. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Mike. You. See ya.